I'm Dr. Tina Wang, a medical doctor, board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, specializing in fascia. I practice a unique blend of osteopathic, integrative, and regenerative medicine at my practice, Tupelo Point Healing Arts here in Claremont, California. A large percentage of my practice is working with people living with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and hypermobile spectrum disorder. It's important for us to remember that every person is unique, and that includes every EDS and HSD patient. Therefore, our approaches must be customized to the person's individual needs. After a decade of asking why, exploring my own health issues and struggles, I have developed a working model for integrative health termed the dynamic integrative model for fascia. In today's talk, we're gonna take a deep dive into the model and explore how it can help you fit together the pieces of your health. It will help you understand how, when, why to use certain interventions like acupuncture, meditations, and injections. So why is an integrative approach important? The EDS Society recommends that treatment approaches should be holistic and include alternative approaches like osteopathic manipulations. But the question is, how should these interventions or complementary interventions be implemented? With which tools, when, how much, where do we intervene? The dynamic integrative model for fascia can aid in this holistic approach to the health of the person. By nature, models are not perfect, but they are a starting point to organize our thoughts and our approaches. There are an infinite number of allopathic medical therapies. These are prescription medications, steroid injection surgeries, as well as a a bunch of complementary therapies. These are prolotherapy, supplements, acupuncture. Modeling allows us to understand when and where to use certain interventions. The model is shaped like an inverted triangle and this can seem unstable. This is because small shifts in the base elements can cause large changes in the dynamic balance of your health. Our health is in constant shift and needs dynamic balance of all elements. So let's explore each component of the model. Each box represents an element to health. Each level represents a categorization of these elements. Structural and biochemical health, also known as inflammation, are often the only focus of most people and professionals, and rightly so, because they are extremely important to health. But underlying these, we need to look at the supporting elements, the biomechanical and neurologic health. Without proper movement, safety, rest, and sleep cycles, we cannot support the changes to the structural and biochemical levels. Fundamental to all health is social and spiritual well being. Without knowing our purpose in life, without being able to trust and connect with the world around us, the changes we make to the levels above are unsustainable. So let's look at this in picture form. The form of the elements vary by person and are unique, like cairns, a rock sculpture. In this first cairn, the spiritual element is weak making the structure seem tenuous. In this individual, we may choose to bolster the spiritual level and social level to support this person as a whole. This might look like supporting religious practices, energy or spiritual practices that align with this patient's belief, something as simple as journaling or as conventional as family therapy. In this second cairn, the spiritual and social levels are strong but the neurologic and biomechanical levels need support. So some interventions would be physical therapy, 
somatics like Alexander or Feldenkrais technique, and as conventionally as antidepressants. So using this wireframe of the model, let's explore some of the more common complementary interventions available for EDS and HSD. Let's start with needling and injection techniques because this is so prevalent and popular with a lot and a large part of our breakout workshops will be addressing these. This includes dry needling, platelet rich plasma, uh, percutaneous tendinotomies and prolotherapy. And let's explore how these elements fit into the model. Steroids are a standard medical intervention for pain. The idea is that the corticosteroid suppresses inflama inflammation and therefore pain. Now these tend to break down tissue. In contrast, regenerative injections like prolotherapy, PRP stem cells cause an inflammatory reaction that uses the body's natural abilities to heal. In essence, we're re-injuring tissue to allow the tissue to heal properly. Then there are dry needling techniques, which were precursors to regenerative injections. And these are more commonly done as a modality by physical therapists in the United States. There is tenonotomy, which is a purely physical intervention that removes excess pathologic tissues like calcifications. And in contrast, acupuncture and other very traditional techniques, they cross multiple levels in their mechanisms and are not based on our modern understanding of pathophysiology and rather they're based in their own philosophical principles. This is classical acupuncture as opposed to a structural based acupunctural approach that is more akin to dry needling rather than true classical acupuncture. And there's Botox, which is a purely neurologic intervention Recently, my colleague, uh, Dr. Dash Kapoor, he's a leading expert in dystonia, and Dr. Stecco and I have collaborated in using ultra low dose Botox based on fascial sequences. And this has tremendous positive effects in our patients. Um, and we're into this biomechanical level as well. And we're hoping to see structural changes even months down the road on follow up. There's fascial layer specific hydro manipulation. This is a technique that I developed to specifically treat the fascia. It mechanically opens up the layers that are stuck together and washes away the inflammatory medi mediators in the tissue. And this promotes proper gliding before between tissue uh, fascial layers. Let's see how this works. So fascial layer specific hydro manipulation is a novel technique in the diagnosis and treatment of specific fascial layers contributing to myofascial pain, the aches and pains in your body. The treatment points are selected after a specific diagnostic process, the STECO method. It's a fascial sequencing diagnosis technique it involves clinical examination of specific movements and palpatory verification. That is a layer specific touch to find these points. The flush technique, the hydro manipulation involves using ultrasound guidance seen here on the left side of the screen and with normal saline injection into specific fascial layers of the myofascial unit seen on the right of the screen. And why is this necessary? In a study that I conducted with Dr. Stecco, we found that hypermobile EDS patients have a thicker extracellular matrix layer of the deep fascia. It's the dark stuff between uh, the lighter layers. And this is compared to their non-hypermobile counterparts. Hy hydro manipulation, the flush technique, serves to dilute out the excess extracellular matrix in these areas. Here's a diagram of fascia. On the left is normal organized fascial tissue. In the middle of the screen, we see disorganized densification or thickening of the fascial tissue in that extracellular matrix. On the right 
the fascial layer uh, hydro manipulation technique uses the pressure of injected saline represented by the arrow to mechanically disrupt the viscous nature, the sticky nature of this e extracellular matrix content, as well as flushing out the various uh, inflammatory mediators in these areas that cause pain and disrupt uh, proper gliding of the tissue layers. So let's see how uh, some interventions might look on a timeline. Your doctor might use steroids, it may or may not work. Following this, you and your doctor may decide to use regenerative medicine uh, injection techniques. I generally do multiple types of injections in one sitting, including the hydro manipulation. Ideally, you'll receive ongoing physical therapy afterwards and notice an improvement. And subsequently, you may need to repeat injections every six months to two years, depending on your body. So what does this look like in the context of the model? Before injections, you may need to optimize the nutritional elements. After injections, we would have to load the tissue correctly with physical therapy. And how we load our tissues also includes how we hold our bodies. And how we hold our bodies are subject to how we feel. If we feel scared or frightened versus if we are feeling strong, confident, positive. And we might use somatics like Feldenkrais to influence this. And then we may need to provide ongoing support for the strong foundation of trust and connection this patient may have with family and community. This may look like getting this patient involved in family walks or more community events. Manual therapies are another way to influence the fascial system. Massage and manual therapy techniques tend to influence individual levels. There's deep tissue massage or joint mobilization that influences the body structure. There's lymphatic massage and techniques that cause drainage of inflammatory mediators. And then there's soft tissue work, gentle soft tissue work like Swedish massage, strain counter strain techniques, muscle energy that balance the nervous system. Chiropractic and osteopathic interventions like high velocity, low amplitude technique, this is the thrust you get. Um, and these can actually be quite gentle when they're done correctly. They're great as a single level influence to help align subluxed or dislocated joints. There's the fascial, uh, stecco fascial uh, sequencing technique, which involves multiple levels and test and retest with improvements in neurologic parameters like motor control and strength. So this is your how strong you are and how much uh, control and balance you have of your body. And traditional osteopathy like biodynamics, this is the type of osteopathy that I study, influences the entire system. It's done in the tradition of A.T. Stills and Sutherland and is counterposed to these other uh, single level techniques. It works on the entire system from the spiritual level all the way through to the structural level. And oftentimes I give my patients homework and self-care. Um, these might include self-mobilization techniques where I teach patients how to put their joints back in or other movement and breathing techniques to help calm their amped up nervous system. For the clinicians watching, there is evidence, good evidence for these interventions. Osteopathic technique produces a distinct and specific response in brain areas um, related to interoception. The stecho method, laser therapy, electric stimulation, they reduce the thickness of the extracellular matrix and pain levels. The type and quantity of manual therapy intervention is dependent on the person before you. So a person who needs only a single level intervention, we would choose the appropriate type of manual therapy for that level. Let's review some of these. You may use joint mobilization for a sublux joint. 
you may choose to use Swedish massage for someone who is completely stressed out. For a person who's in need of multi-level intervention, traditional osteopathy may be warranted. And afterwards, a self-mobilization program using breathing techniques like Vini yoga, the type of yoga meditation that I study and teach to my patients, these may be implemented to facilitate continued healing long after the visit. Manual therapy is important and can influence multiple levels, but almost every study shows that it's best when combined with movement. And movement is the linchpin of wellness. To maintain our physiologic curves, we have to maintain motion. If we lose motion and weight bearing, we lose our dynamic curves. At the end of the day, we have to have proper movement for health. Gentle stretching is a great anti-inflammatory exercise. This is based on the work of Dr. Elaine Langevin, who gave the pain lecture in April. In her research, she demonstrated the anti-inflammatory effects of stretching in rat models. Pilates, somatics like Feldenkrais and Alexander technique, and dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. This is a movement approach, which I prescribe quite a bit of. It works on the neurologic level to influence the biomechanical level. Aquatherapy is a good intervention weight when weight bearing is limited. This is in the case of fractures or severe orthostatic uh, intolerance. So these are the patients who pass out when standing up. And it works on a purely biomechanical level to keep the person moving. And study after study has proven that walking is the best intervention. It works across all levels, starting with the simple biomechanical level, um, modulation of inflammation, and changing of structure through proper loading. And walking likely integrates the body on a neurologic level as well. Histor historically, humans have de developed as walking creatures with social activity like hunting and migration practices. And walking has a strong spiritual aspect. Historically, that looks like walking meditation and pilgrimages. Then there are more specific types of loading exercises that target the tendons and connective tissue of the body. This is my current clinical study with my patients where we're looking at how we can help EDS and HSD patients strengthen their connective tissue by using specific types of loads that we place on their body. Now let's look at how um, all of these elements fit together. So we might use the flush technique, the hydro manipulation, and we may follow this with manual therapy. Subsequently, we would use a regenerative technique like prolotherapy. Then we may include Pilates, either with a physical therapist or an experienced movement practitioner to make changes at the neurologic and biomechanical levels to support structural and biochemical changes that were made through the injections. And lastly, we would encourage this patient to continue her yoga practice for social and spiritual support. Another way to provide solid building blocks for structural health is to optimize the inputs. This is the water, food, air, and environment. Air and sufficient oxygenation are extremely important. And we heard from the prior pain lecture in April about supplemental oxygen. We also must have sufficient hydration. For many, additional salts and electrolytes are needed to drive the hydration into the tissue and the cells. And sometimes additional hydration is needed to, uh, be, needed to be supplemented through IV fluids. Environmental factors also pay, play a large role. If there are mold, heavy metal, or radiation exposures, these must be remediated. Natural paths and functional medicine practitioners are skilled at helping patients address these issues. Food is another vital aspect and extremely important. 
There are a myriad of diets and fads and finding the correct combination for you will be extremely challenging because there is no one size fits all diet. And the data and information available are obfuscated by bribery and influence of the food industrial complex. The brain is known in traditional healing systems as the sec uh, the gut is known in traditional healing systems as the second brain. The enteric cells, the cells lining the GI gastrointestinal tract are responsible for over 95% of the body's serotonin production. The gut microbiota, these are the gut bacteria, they are influenced by our food intake and really impact the GI serotonergic system. So our bodies cannot function properly if this second brain is not functioning properly. Correlations have been observed between this gut microbiota composition and behavioral temperament, that's your personality, asthma, mood disorders like anxiety and depression, as well as cognitive function, brain fog. So let's see how our bodies respond to food. The threshold is where symptoms like abdominal cramping, dizziness, and nausea appear. When we eat, we move from a high baseline state below the threshold to above the threshold where symptoms show up. Our goal is to move our body, body's baseline inflammatory state towards the green line. So our normal inflammatory response to food stays below the threshold where symptoms arise. We do this by influencing everything else in the model that we had talked about, as well as avoiding inflammatory foods like processed grains and sugars. Our diets must be tailored to our individual needs. According to Dr. Hyman, the godfather of functional medicine, each of us must find the right diet based on our genes, our metabolism, as well as our belief system. Historically, food has transcended multiple levels. There are spiritual beliefs tied to food consumptions. We see this across all cultures in fasting traditions. Food and meals are a social event, a, com a community activity. We create, move, walk, think in food and meal creation. And it's only in modern times that food has been limited to just the structural and biochemical levels. But asking ourselves and our patients to return to this historical model of food preparation and consumption may not be realistic. A detailed personalized food plan is a very difficult conversation that I have with every single one of my patients. But what if you don't have access to this type of resource? What do you do? Where do you start? The simplest first step is to follow Michael Pollan's rule, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So basically eat real food. Real food should look like what it does when it comes out of the ground. You can eat meat, but just don't eat too much. Our food source is devoid of nutrients and requires supplementation. Modern agriculture technique uses over fertilization of topsoil devoid of nutrients. The same limited source of genetically modified seeds inhibits, bio, bio, inhibits biodiversity of our food source. So we end up eating the same old stuff over and over. So most people need supplementation with basic vitamins and minerals. There will also be more discussions of topical compounds, off-label FDA approved meds and cannabis in the breakout sessions. Let's see where they fit into the model. Cannabis works on the inflammatory and structural levels. Carla Stecco's immunohistochemistry work shows that there are CBD receptors in the fascia. Topicals, CBD, and standard medications like ibuprofen work on the biochemical level to modulate inflammation. And opioids work on the neurologic level on pain receptors. Off-label use of medications like low-dose naltrexone can modulate the central nervous system 
and change the brain's response to nociceptive signals or sensory inputs. Herbals like turmeric are also very popular and most people think that they act at the biochemical level with anti-inflammatory effects and they can if used as a nutraceutical. But herbal supplements used by traditional healers like Chinese traditional medicine or Ayurvedic practitioners are an energetic treatment. The foundational elements are the most important level of the holistic approach. Spiritual care allows us to find purpose and meaning in life. Why is this important? The fascia is where the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response, cross links and talks with the immune system and the fascial system. The mast cells seen here on the right of the screen, they release mediators that propagate action potentials in the nerve. That means they send signals up the nerve and this can lead to pain or sympathetic responses like stress. This means that your immune system changes your fight or flight state. And in reverse, your stress state influences your immune system directly. These nerves and mast cells also interact in proximity or close to arteries. And they constitute a triangle of paracrine, autocrine, and endocrine interaction, meaning these processes take place all over the body. In addition, fibroblasts and myofibroblasts, these are the cells that create the connective tissue in your body. They also exert influence on the immune and nervous system through this direct mechanism. So we must support our patient's foundation comprised of spiritual, social, and neurologic wellness. Some common interventions that influence these levels are acupuncture again, religious practices, um, meditation and yoga, as well as our relationships with pets and animals. Many of us are drawn to equestrianism. Let's look at why this is and how this promotes health. I am a member of a consortium of professionals dedicated to the health triad made up of the horse, person, and environment. The horse and person release oxytocin. This is the love hormone in response to each other. This is the same process that occurs between a mother and her child. There are biomechanical and neurologic influences in horse riding that promote core strength and endurance. There are also healing effects of, of being in nature. And both the horse and person respond and influence the environment around them by promoting trust, intuitive listening, and love. In yogic and Ayurvedic traditions, our experiences and our senses through our bodies influence and change our spiritual state, which in turn change our physical state. The modern science exploration of this phenomenon can be seen in the response of the insular cortex to interoception. This is what we feel inside our body and exteroception, what we feel outside of our body. The fascia and its connection to the insula seen here in these functional MRI images may be that physical link by which these spiritual processes take place. Our sense of our internal world and how we relate to the outside world likely occurs through the fascial system. So a couple take home points. Where do you start? Start by finding a primary care physician who's attentive to your needs. This doesn't need to be an EDS expert. It just has to be a caring individual who's willing to partner with you on this journey and build your team around this special relationship. Next, determine your needs. Who are you? Find your purpose. Determine the shape of your cairn, your rock sculpture. Only then can you determine which levels need to be strengthened and where and how to use all the tools available to you as you continue on this journey to finding your health. 